There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling. But for the showers we plead, there shall be showers of blessing, precious reviving again. Over the hills and the valleys, sound of abundance of rain, showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead on the last. There shall be showers of blessing, oh that today they might fall. Now as to God we're confessing, now as on Jesus we call. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. Amen. Wonderful. You can be seated. So good to see you here in the house of the Lord. I trust you've had a good day. It's been a nice chilly day. But thank God for his warmth in our hearts, and thank God for the great day that we've had. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you again for the beautiful day you've blessed us with, for the blessings on our lives, and for the privilege and joy that we have to come back and gather ourselves together in worship to you. I pray now that you bless our service tonight. You know what we stand in need of, our speaker tonight. And everything that's done, may it accomplish what you have set forth for it to do. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our hearts and in our lives. We praise you for it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. I remind you, of course, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, our Bible study. We're studying about the Holy Spirit on Wednesday night. Don't forget that. I hope you can be with us here and in person, 7 o'clock on Wednesday night. Then, of course, Sunday mornings, Sunday school Bible study times at 10 o'clock on uh, Sunday morning, and then our regular worship service at 11. And uh, we've got a high attendance Sunday school uh, goal for the first Sunday in December. I hope you're inviting someone and encouraging them to come and be with us for our Sunday school high attendance day in December, December the first Sunday in December. All right. Okay, Brother Daniel, come on. Without him I could do nothing. Without him I'd surely fail. Without him I would be drifting like a ship without a sail. Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? You can turn him away, oh Jesus, oh Jesus. Without him, how lost I would be. Without him, I could be dying. Without him, I'd be enslaved. Without him, life would be hopeless. But with Jesus, thank God, I'm saved. Jesus, oh Jesus, 
Do you know him today? You can't turn him away. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Without him, how lost I would be. Wonderful, wonderful song, wonderful singing. We're going to dismiss our kids to Kids Blast. Get them excited. They always get excited about Kids Blast. Amen. They're headed out there. Our, our speaker tonight is Brother Ricky Duke. He's coming. And uh, we're excited about hearing him tonight as well. Amen. Our big kids out here are excited about hearing Brother Ricky Duke. Our little kids are headed out yonder, and our big kids in here are excited about hearing Brother Ricky Duke. Amen. Maybe they won't jump up and down on you in here, but if they do, it'll be okay, won't it? Okay. Bless you, Brother Ricky. You bring whatever the Lord's got. If you got your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 26, and if you'll stand for the reading of the Word of God, we'll just look at just a very few verses here, and then we'll get into the message. But Acts chapter 26, again reading in verse 9, it says, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus Christ, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints that I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even into strange cities. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining around about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, for to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Father God, we thank you for another opportunity to look into your word. And Father, I pray tonight as we look into your word and look at Paul's testimony that, that God will search our own hearts and our own minds and, yes. and God realize that, that we do all have a testimony. And God, are we like Paul? Are we willing to share that testimony or are we ashamed of what, what you've done for us? And God, as we look into your word, I just pray that you just bless the... Bless your word tonight, and may it not return into you void. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. What is a testimony? Well, the dictionary says it's a statement of fact given in court, and it's also a public statement of one's conversion or religious experience. And if we look back in just a few chapters in Acts, you'll see that Paul has given his testimony before the Pharisees. He's given it before the people. He's given it before Governor Felix, before Governor Festus. And now here he's standing before King Agrippa. And he's again given his testimony. He's ready to give his testimony again before the king. So that's what we want to look tonight now in a message is simply called, you know, Paul's testimony. Amen. So all we're going to look at is his testimony. But we're going to try to apply it to our lives and the way we do. First thing we see in verses 9 through 12 is Paul's conduct. And what I'm talking about here is, is Paul is testifying in the first part of these verses here to what his life was before. Amen. Now, 
the first thing we know about Paul, and we all know, is according to Acts chapter 22 and verse 3, that Paul himself was a Pharisee. Verse 3 says, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Sicilia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and I was zealous toward God as ye are this day. And we find also in chapter 23, in verse 6, Paul says, But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I'm called in question. So Paul was a Pharisee. In other words, he is a religious man. He's very religious. He knew the word of God that was available then. He knew the first five books. Of the, you know, they say that they had to memorize the whole first five books of the Bible. So he knew the word of God. But yet he was lost. Says he was zealous toward God, yet his religion was in vain. We covered some of this this morning in Sunday school, you know. Religious people go to hell. Yes, sir. Go ahead, brother. That's good. I, I, you know, you, you hate to be that way, I hate to, but, but apart from Jesus Christ, yes. you have no hope. You may be sincere, and I know you've heard that before, but they're sincerely wrong. You cannot work your way into heaven. Amen. You cannot do enough good things to overcome your sin nature. But Paul was trying to do that. Paul said, I'm zealous for God, just like y'all are. You know, I was trying my best to do everything that I thought God wanted done. Yeah. Get rid of those Christians. Get rid of those heretics and those radical people. That's what he was thinking as a Pharisee, and that's what he was doing. So what was he not only a Pharisee in his past conduct, but he was also a persecutor. You know, him being a Pharisee, as I said, knowing the, the word of God, he should have known the prophecies concerning the Messiah. They all should have. But they all ignored the fact that as Jesus Christ walked the face of this earth right here, fulfilling all of those prophecies, they ignored it. Paul's right in that line. Yeah. Paul fell right in there with them. He became a persecutor. Notice again what it says in, in chapter 26. He says in verse 9, I barely thought with myself that I ought to do many things, Contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Contrary to the Messiah. Contrary to who Jesus was. And notice there he says in verse 10, Which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, notice what he says, I gave my voice against them. Yeah. The more that was killed, the happier he was. He was, he was putting, hey, yeah, he, he's blasphemed God. He accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. We need to kill him. And as they was killed, he was happy. He was joyous that this was taking place. And notice he said, and I punished them off in verse 11 in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. What did he do? Compel him. He beat them. He tortured them. He done anything and everything that he could in order to get them to blaspheme the name of Jesus Christ. And notice it said too, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. He went everywhere he could trying to find the Christians, weed out the Christians and persecuted them. And that word mad right there, of course, just, just means that he was in a rage. An uncontrollable desire to punish every Christian that he could. Back in Acts chapter 22, as he was giving his testimony again there, he says in verse 19, he says, And I said, Lord, 
They know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on me. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, now at the time Stephen was being shed, Paul didn't consider him a martyr. He considered him a, a, ra a radical fanatic, you know. But he says, as your uh, martyr Stephen's blood was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death. And kept the raiment of them that slew him. He held the jackets of the guys that were throwing the, the stones to kill him. But you know what's interesting? That word consent means to have pleasure in. He's consenting to this. He's having pleasure. I mean, he was grinning from ear to ear as Stephen was being stoned. You know, that was sin in Paul's life. He didn't realize it at the time. As he says over, and I believe it's in Timothy, where he says, you know, I did this out of ignorance. You know. But at the time, he was zealous. He thought he was doing everything for God. But it was sin. Hebrews eleven twenty five. 25, last part of that verse says that there is pleasure in sin for a season. Sin can be pleasurable. But sin, what does it do? It starts dragging us down. Yeah, there's pleasure, but see that pleasure don't last. That's why a drug addict, that's why an alcoholic, that's why a gambler or any, anything that you get addicted to, that's why you continue to do it more and more and more and more because that pleasure goes away. So you're trying to do something else to, to get back that original feeling, that original pleasure that you enjoy. So since that pleasure doesn't last, we go deeper and deeper into sin. To sin has such a grip on us that we see no way out. There's no way out. But there is a way out. Amen. And we see that in verses 13 through 15. Not only we see Paul's conduct, his past life, the way he done, but now we see Paul's conversion. Paul, a murderer, a blasphemer, a persecutor of Christians is now confronted before Christ. He's confronted by Christ. But notice in verses 13 and 14. It says, At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun. Can you imagine that? How, how bright that light was. Shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now notice it was personal. It was personal. We find in, in other scriptures and Paul's doing this and he said the light said, you know, some of them they heard the voice, or they heard the sound, but they didn't understand because Jesus wasn't talking to them. Amen. Yeah. It's personal. Yes, sir. He was calling and talking directly to Paul. He called him by name. Salvation is a personal matter. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can't get saved for you. No. Brother Joel can't get saved for you. Amen. It's a personal matter between you and God. But you're sitting there maybe and thinking, and you know, and I know most everybody in the congregation here is saved, but people that's watching on YouTube and Facebook Live, you know, you may not be saved. You may not know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And you may be sitting there thinking, well, you just don't know what I've done. You don't know what kind of life that I've lived. Look at what Paul has done. A murderer, a blasphemer, a persecutor of Christian people. And God said, Saul, Saul. He talked to him and he called him personally. You see, God can and will save anyone no matter what our past sins are. No matter what kind of life that you're living right now. 
God will save you. Yes. And then look at, not only it was personal, but look at his perception in verse 15. It says, and I said, who art thou, Lord? See, that's the first thing it takes. That's what we've got to do. We've got to recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. We've got to recognize that it was him that gave his life on the cross of Calvary for our sins. Yes. And when we recognize that, we can call him Lord. Yes. And Paul says, Lord, who art thou? And Jesus says, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuted. Now listen to this. Can you imagine how Paul felt? Oh, wait a minute. You're Jesus? You died on the cross. They buried you. They stole your body away and hid your body away. At least that's what I was told. Yeah. But now he's sitting there talking face to face yeah. and having a conversation with Jesus Christ. Yes, Paul realized then that in persecuting Christians, he'd been persecuting their master, their Lord. He'd been persecuting the Messiah, the very Son of God. He realized that. And he put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So if you're worried tonight about the sins that you've committed, what, what kind of life am I living right now? What kind of life have I lived? If you're worried about that, worried about your sins are, are so bad that God can't forgive you, and that is bothering you, that's just the Holy Spirit convicting you. That's just God calling your name and said you need to put your faith and trust in my son, Jesus Christ, because he paid that sin debt for you. You know, you can't overcome your sins apart from Jesus Christ. But what about all of us, especially the ones sitting in this room tonight? We've all accepted Jesus Christ, you know, as our personal Savior. Paul's testimony carries on right over into us. Yes, Not only do we see Paul's conduct, his past life, nor do we see Paul's conversion, but lastly, we see Paul's commission. Yes, you know, service for Christ doesn't stop at conversion. It starts at conversion. Verses 16 and 18 through 18, we see Christ's plan for Paul's life. And, you know, Christ has laid out a plan for Paul, but in essence, that plan is a plan for us also. Look, he says, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. We'll stop there for a second. Look, he, he told Paul, um, of course he was Saul then, but he changed his name to Paul. But he says, arise up. I got a job for you to do. Yes, sir. I got a plan for your life. Yes. He's got a plan for every one of our lives Amen. in here. Amen. He's got a plan. It may not be, you know, to go to some foreign country as a missionary, it may just be to go across the street to your neighbor. Amen. But God's got a plan for our life. And he told us, he said, look, I want you to witness and be a witness of the things which thou hast seen and the things in which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you know about. I'm going to appear to you. We can all witness to our past conduct. We can all be a witness to the things that God has done in our life. Because yes. there's not a dare, I dare say there's not nobody in this room tonight that can't say that God ain't blessed you at one time or another. Amen. And that's all a testimony. That's all a witness is. You know, we, we can talk and tell everybody, hey, look, man, I'm a sinner too. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. You know, you don't know what I used to do in my past life. You don't know the things that I did. You don't know what kind of person I was. But Jesus Christ came into my life and he forgave me of all of those things. That's all it takes to be a witness. 
That's all it takes to testify. It's just telling people what God has done for us. And notice verse 18, it says, To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Notice what it says. That just reveals to others that, hey, we were also blind at one time, but now we see. We're no longer controlled by Satan. We've got the Holy Spirit that indwells each and every one of us. And notice right there, he says, but you're sanctified by faith that is in the church, right? That is in your works. That is it? No. He said that it, it that is in me. Only through Jesus Christ can our sins be forgiven. And then lastly, in verse 19, we see Paul's perseverance. He says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. You know, too many times you and I, we're ashamed, we're afraid to share the gospel. What are they going to think about? I mean, i got to work with these people. You know, I, I've got to, you know, whatever. We get ashamed. We, we get afraid. But Paul persevered. And we're not going to take time to look totally in it. But if you look in, what is it, Corinthians? Paul gives a whole list of things that happened to him. I mean, you know, he was beat, shipwrecked, you know, left for dead, stoned. I mean, you, we could read the whole list of all the things in more than one time. I mean, he was left for dead, but he persevered. He persevered. You see, Paul wasn't ashamed of the gospel. He told Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, verse 7, he says, For God hath not given us, he's talking here, he's putting... You and I in with the, in this statement. He's not given us the spirit of fear, no. but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony right. of our Lord. That's what Paul says. You and I have we shouldn't fear. We've got the Holy Spirit in dwelling. You know, God is going to take care of us. He took care of Paul. Yeah, Paul was beat. Paul went through some things. But until God got through with him, Paul was protected. So we're to not be ashamed. He also says in verse 12, For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. Notice this. For I know whom I believe. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. If you're saved, that's what I said. God, God protected Paul. Yeah, Paul went through stuff. God will protect you until he gets through with you. Yes. If you put your faith, do you trust God? Do you believe that God is able to keep you saved? Do you believe God has got you in the palm of his hand? Then why are we afraid? Why are we ashamed to be a faithful witness for him? And then he also said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, he says, Paul says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. Yeah. So you see what Paul's saying. I, you know, I know, I believe in God, and one of these days I'm going to get a crown because I was faithful to the end. I persevered. Yeah. But that verse don't stop there. No. He says, and not to me only, but until all them that love his appearing. That includes you and I. So what about our testimony? Are you willing to share it? Do you share it every opportunity 
that the Lord puts before you. Brother Joel. What a great message tonight. Thank you, Brother Ricky. What a great message tonight. Amen. Maybe you need to come and ask the Lord to give you more boldness to share your testimony. A lost and dying world needs to hear what God has done for us. While they sing us a verse of a song, God speaking to your heart, these altars are open. You come tonight. You come. God speaking to your heart. You come. Amen. You come.